we all recognise poverty when we come across it in our own lives as students or as we approach retirement age and find it difficult to make ends meet. We recognise it in our neighbourhoods when we find somebody sleeping rough on the pavement or as we watch people queuing at food banks running out of food every week. But it's much more difficult to say what poverty actually is if we try and put it into words or to know how we know that it's poverty. And that's a problem which is confronted by social scientists who work professionally on these topics too. Part of the problem that social scientists confront in defining poverty is the fact that it looks different in different places. Poverty found in the east end of Oslo is very different from what you might find in Shanghai or in Lusaka, Kampala or Quito. Certainly, materially, it is very different. Although there is considerable growing evidence that the way that people feel and experience poverty is very similar, irrespective of the economic and cultural circumstances in which they are located. Another difficulty in thinking about poverty is whether we see it in absolute terms or in relative terms, whether we see it as a matter of life and death, food necessary to maintain survival, or whether we're prepared to conceive of poverty as being relative into the society in which people live, something that prevents them through a lack of resources, a lack of income, from being able fully to participate, to be a full and true member of the society in which they live. Poverty is also inherently political. Politicians don't get elected saying, vote for me and I will increase the poverty rate. No, we're all committed to reducing poverty, even though the priority that we give to that problem is often less than it might warrant. Opinions about poverty and how to tackle it are often grounded in our understanding and beliefs about how society works. We often differ according to the priority that we give to structural factors as causes of poverty, whether it's factors beyond the ability of individuals to control that are the root cause of poverty. Whatever our views about the nature of poverty and its causes, there's increasingly consensus that poverty is not just the lack of resources, it's much more than that. But poverty is inherently multidimensional. The challenge is to tackle poverty in all its forms, everywhere. And as you begin to read through the reading material, it might be helpful to bear in mind answers to these questions. What are the dimensions of poverty? What form does it take and does it take the same form in every country or does it differ according to cultural circumstances and the level of economic development? I want now to move on to consider how one determines the dimensions of poverty. In the academic literature and in the policy world, there are essentially four different approaches to determining what poverty is and what dimensions are important. The first approach is essentially pragmatic. It says, what can we readily measure? It says, what dimensions can policy successfully influence? It asks, what data can we lay our hands on? Take, for example, the Human Poverty Index that was first used in 1997. That essentially ranked countries according to three dimensions of poverty. First of all, there was mortality, health, then literacy, education, and finally a measure of living standards that was essentially based upon health care, access to safe water, and the incidence of child malnourishment. Likewise, the multidimensional poverty index that replaced the human poverty index also measures the same three dimensions, health, education, and living standards, and it uses 10 indices in order to do so. A second broad approach to the dimensions of poverty is a more theoretical approach. A Marcia Sen, for example, a Nobel Prize winning economist, argued that poverty is not just a lack of income, but rather the failure of people to achieve minimum capabilities. Capabilities are essentially universal. 
but they are attained through consumption, through the acquisition and use of commodities. And those are context specific, culturally determined and hence inevitably relative. At a more practical level, Mohkul Notewar and colleagues working in South Africa have thought about the dimensions of poverty relating to children and they have come up with eight specific dimensions. Material deprivation, health deprivation, human capital, education, what can be attained, social capital, the resources that you have at your disposal, the living environment, adequate care for children, freedom from abuse, and the prospect of physical safety. A third approach to understanding what the dimensions of poverty might be involve engaging with the general public and asking, what do you think? Oliver Matapuri, working in Zimbabwe, attempted to do this within an agricultural economy. And he came up with important pointers. Within that community, a hut or a house was clearly important, but not quite as important as having cattle. An ox-drawn plough, a garden, an ox-drawn harrow, a hoe, a tractor, a goat, were all in crucially important in determining people's lives and protecting them from the scourge of poverty. In a slightly different setting, South Africa, Gemma Wright and her colleagues looked at what, a ter that what they termed socially perceived necessities. Socially perceived necessities are things which are essential for everybody to have in order to enjoy an acceptable standard of living within modern day South Africa. And amongst the list of items that they identified were mains electricity in a house, a house strong enough to stand up to the rain and the weather, clothing sufficient to keep you warm, but also a fridge and having an adult in the household to provide care for children. There was also a demand for a place of worship, somebody to look after you when you're ill and the resources necessary to bury you when you die. A final approach to identifying the meaning of poverty is perhaps the most obvious and yet the most radical and that is to ask people who are directly experiencing poverty to ask them what they think. Of course there is a logical problem with this approach. How do we know who is in poverty and therefore who we should speak to before we know what poverty actually is? But nevertheless, a number of people have tried this approach. Most recently, the International Women's Development Agency, when they developed this year, 2015, what they call an individual deprivation measure. And as one might expect, it comes up with things like food and water and shelter, as the other measures did. But it also mentions health and education and more particularly energy necessary for cooking, sanitation, a personal toilet, family relations, the ability to take decisions within one's own household, and also voice, the ability, the acceptability of participating in public policy making within their local community. So as you read further into the reading material, it might be helpful to bear in mind a couple more questions. One might be what you think the dimensions of poverty should be. And secondly, what makes you think that? What is your reasoning behind the choices that you make? I think poverty has to do with a lack of income or a lack of money-like resources necessary to make ends meet. But of course, it is more than just a lack of income. It is the multiple consequences of that lack of income that people in poverty experience simultaneously. And some of those dimensions in future years become the causes of, if not poverty per se, then the reasons why poverty is perpetuated. This definition of multidimensional poverty is very broad in its conception. It suggests that we should not only consider income, but of course the material deprivation that results from that. We need to think about the local environment, about place, and about the factors associated there. 
for example, the risk of violence in one's local neighbourhood. We need to take account of the financial strain and stress of trying to make ends meet. The social relationships associated with poverty, for example, social exclusion and lack of social capital. We'd be interested to take account of the shame and stigma that people feel, the sense of powerlessness and lack of agency that they experience as a consequence of being in poverty. There's issues to do with physical ill health and the psychological ill-being, anxiety, stress, depression, broad though this conception of poverty is. It is also narrow in one respect, but the only dimensions we take account of are those that can be directly linked to a lack of income or money-like resources. We could think of income-rich but asset-poor households, those who are physically fit but financially stressed. Poverty, defined in this way, is dynamic. It not only describes the circumstances people find themselves in at present, it points to the circumstances that they're likely to experience in future. It's both present and future combined. While there is now consensus that poverty is multidimensional, there is much less consensus about how we should measure it. With the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development already upon us, and the expectation that there will need to be a multidimensional poverty index for each country in the world, the science of poverty measurement has rapidly to catch up with policy intent. If it does not do so, the dangers are very real. Just imagine the consequences of using measures that don't accurately reflect the multidimensionality of poverty. Consider, as you explore the reading pack, the implications of policy targeting dimensions, which in reality are of little importance to those who are experiencing poverty, and which have no impact whatsoever on those dimensions that matter a great deal.